Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 99 of I Got Gameplay. Yes, it's a very, very special episode that we've got today, counting down to episode 100 of the show as well. And we've got someone with us who's basically been on the show previously and has made his way back to the show after I've been pestering him for so long to do so. He is the man, the myth, the legend. He is the Dace-tacular himself, Mr. Chris the Dace-man Dace. Hey, 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 what is up, IGG? It's been a while. It has been a while, and, and it's actually quite funny, because um, I remember the last time I had you on, that kind of springboarded your your own show, like the, the Dace Man show. It gave you kind of the decision to, to go that route when you did IGG with me, and that was when we did the... Um, uh, the the worst, I, I believe it was like the worst games of 2013, um, mm. and it and it was no I think it was 2012, 2012, 2013, and it was when um, we were talking about Lara Croft shooting the guy in the dick, and yeah. uh, <laughs> but it, it kind of gave you like the taste of of going back into to podcasting because I know you took a kind of a hiatus from it for a while and then uh, went back created the Dace Man show which is now, you know, basically an ongoing success for yourself as well. So how's things going on that? Ah, it's going very well. We are the longest episode, weekly episodic show <laughs> uh, on megapowersradio.com. We've just, uh, we hit 70 this week. Uh, if you guys have been listening in, the past couple, actually couple months, we've had guest after guest showing up, video game creators, which I think... Uh, I, I should forward the information to you guys because they're very interesting to hear their story, uh, as well as musicians. And well, we actually have a Playboy Bunny coming on uh, this week. Oh, gosh. Yeah, so it's not just like uh, trannies anymore. So you've actually got <laughs> an, an actual real-life Playboy Bunny. We we actually did a, a live episode um, when I was guesting on the show where we decided to call a, a transvestite hooker, which was fun. <laughs> yeah. And, and this, i got to give credit to uh, where credit's due. This guest was brought on by Gibby. Um, usually we, I try to go for like musicians, gamers, actors, stuff like that. He was dead set on bringing the Playboy Bunny on. So leave it to Gibby. Hey, you know, at the, the end of the day, it's still someone in pop culture and, and a Playboy Bunny, that must be very hard. How did Hef let her loose? Uh, it, she's a Playboy Bunny from maybe, uh, early 2000s. I have to look at her bio again, but, uh, she, she's doing modeling now on a circuit, doing conventions, things like that, cosplay. And she's also a seminar speaker, so it should be a very interesting, uh, interview we got coming up. Wow, Hef knows how to pick him. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what about yourself? What have you been up to? Cause I know you've been like tackling loads of different projects, like a, like a mean man at the moment, cause you, you're doing a lot. Um, so let's talk a little bit about those. What's, uh, what have you got currently and what's upcoming? Uh, currently we're going is, of course, the Dace Man Show Wednesday, as we just spoke about. Uh, we have the Four Real Movie Club that airs once a month. We'll be doing horror films coming up uh, October 28th. Um, we also have side projects such as Channel Surfing, which was newly introduced, where I give you a three- to five-minute recap of the show, uh, drunk or sober. It depends on the night and also depends on the show. And we're also got some things coming up with Basement Protocols. We're going to launch an upcoming web series, which you can check out on IMDb, imdb.com for upload fail. We are, we are now on there. Uh, and we just got a bunch of little side projects. I'm actually editing one as we speak that I hope to debut soon. So, um, tell us a little bit about upload failed. What's that about? Uh, upload failed. It's, uh, it's basically what we all tried to do. When it comes to the internet, you see hundreds of videos out there. So here's the concept, and it's kind of loosely based on a true story, but uh, of course exaggerated for comedic effect. There's four people trying to become famous on YouTube and never having the camera operating at the right time, and just hilarity ensues. So the first season will run about 13 episodes, five minutes apiece, uh, and seven out of the 13 have already been filmed. Wow, so you, you looks like you're um, going at this hardcore. Um, so who's like writing and, and directing the pieces at yourself? Uh, when it comes to writing, season one, um, in its entirety was, uh, I would consider myself the head writer with, uh, co-writers of Frank Ward, Vic Straub, and Gibby. Um, season two, so far the episodes that have been written uh, have been heavily written by Frank Ward, so he is definitely the head writer for season two, uh, with me being a co-writer for him. Um, and we even have a spin-off series planned as well as a season three and season four if this thing gets rolling. That's good. So it shows that you're basically um, moving into that kind of direction. Is this a YouTube-only show? 
Uh, as of right now, yes. Um, and it's five minutes. If it picks up and people want to see more, I we have scripts that have gone into the 15-minute range, so I wouldn't mind doing that. We also have uh, made the joke one time, it, we, we shoot four hours worth of footage and only get 20 minutes of usable stuff. <laughs> uh, is this more sort of like cutaway gags, or is it like your more kind of real-to-life, um, shaky cam documentary style? Uh, it, it's a hard cam, so there's definitely... Uh, it's be, unfortunately, being the director, I hit record and I run it on my spot real quick. Um, but a lot of these are centered around the idea, at least the first season, is centered around the ideas of we see a video on YouTube and we want to reenact it to get hits. And that's their primary goal. Let's make a video, let's get hits, let's get famous. Uh, and they say that several times. Meanwhile, nothing goes to them as according to plan. And from there, we get the scenarios that hopefully makes it funny. Awesome. So, guys, check that out. When's the uh, first episode debuting? We're hoping for November. Um, for those of you that have tried to direct and tried to corral a cast that you don't pay, you'll completely understand how difficult it is to film, especially with uh, some of them going to college and work. So we're shooting for a November release. Yeah, I've, I've been there. I can, I can tell you I've been – most of the projects that I've ended up um, having to put on back burner because of the fact that you have to work around people's schedules. And if you're not paying them any money, they tend to get like, well, I, I've got to take this on. I can't do this. And, and it, it, it does turn into a potential nightmare. Um, but yeah, best of luck on that one. Um, so yeah, you were talking about a little bit about channel surfing. Have you watched the new season, uh, of Gotham that's currently in the, the, the season that they've just basically put out there? What do you think of it so far? It's being a comic book fan. It's it's neat to see these characters come to life. It's a shame because it, some of the things I have pro issues with it, and I also have uh, just general problems that kind of break the continuity of the comic book itself. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, I enjoy it. I, I will tell you right now, my hands down, my favorite character, even though this is a James Gordon based show, is Cobblepot. Yeah, I I think he's really good as well. He puts the psycho in psychopath. I just feel like f for me. Um, being someone who watches it and tries to watch it with a new pair of eyes in a sense they they tend like with the first episode they kind of rushed everything in it was like mm -hmm. oh look this is batman you see this person this person is a batman villain do you notice yeah. it? it's about batman see see and his parents are dead so we're gonna eventually turn him batman you see batman look like he's overcoming fear he's burning his hand with a candle batman <laughs> Yeah, and I feel like there's a lot of cameos they threw in there, which just were not needed. Poison Ivy, come on. Yeah, that, and they didn't even call it by a real name. They just called it Ivy. I was yeah. just like, oh, just don't. You didn't need to do that. Um, but it, it seemed like for the first two episodes, it kind of suffered from bad writing. It was like they tried to throw in every trope that they could, like the lesbian ex, you know, ex-girlfriend. It was like, yeah, I, I can see why you did that, but it, it wasn't necessary. You know what I mean? With, the, with Gordon's wife and then, then they were playing on like loads of other different tropes, trying to, um, push the, these extra characters. Like they even had the Joker in the first episode where he was standing in there doing stand up comedy on stage. Yeah. Like I said, the, the, some of the cameos are really freaking forced. Yeah. And it it was one of those things where I think that if you're a comic book fan, you would understand that a lot of these villains came to pass because they were created by Batman, by his presence, in mm -hmm. a sense, and by his own actions. So seeing them in there without him, it's just like, yeah, I, you, you can make them believable if you give someone a, a story. And I think the only person they've kind of built up um, and the only person they've managed to give his own like subtext in his underarching story is Cobblepot. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they've, you, you've seen his journey. You've seen the moment he actually gets thrown out of Gotham to the moment that he makes his dramatic return. And it's interesting to watch him because he's a character like someone like Dexter, for instance, who he's killing, but he has a reason, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a reason why he's trying to manipulate and pull the strings of everybody involved and still trying to make himself look like the good guy. And I think in in terms of what Gotham is, it, it's kind of something that I, I think will end up shining on its own right, as long as they keep building on the stories and separating it 
from the comic books themselves and start focusing on the fact that it's still a procedural drama. It's a police drama. Um, so we need to have the focal point on James Gordon. We need to focus on the fact that he's trying to keep, um, you know, Gotham into away from all the crime and corruption. And he's still trying to do his thing while everything else is going on in the same place. And I think the, the episode that I saw, I think it was episode, uh, four. I think we're on episode five now, aren't we? Which is Viper. Uh, yeah, that's the one airing actually currently right now in yeah. the East Coast. So, um, you know, episode four, which was Arkham, ha- had that whole different premise. You-, you could see the way that he was trying to keep the peace, and at the same time, it, you know, the the mayor decided to to turn on everybody because they needed um, to to have. He he wanted to keep everybody happy in order so he wouldn't get shot in the face um but it's as i said it's it's an interesting concept i do like what they're doing with it but they now need to build upon it otherwise the show itself is just not gonna it's it's gonna end up failing um if they if they do not learn from the mistakes from the first uh, first couple of episodes um but saying that uh, what's your favorite superhero uh tv show that's currently airing uh hands down it's gotta be arrow uh, week in and week out, they impress. Um, Flash is doing really well. It's kind of hard to keep your attention with uh, a guy who just can run really fast. And Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, they always start slow, but they're going to inch towards Age of Ultron, and I'm sure they're going to blow our mind. Well, they've got some balls, um, in my opinion, because look at what they've done with Hydra. Uh, and the fact that they've just destroyed every single thing about the, you know the, the, this kind of this team that they built up and the first episode spoilers by the way the first episode you saw them introduce these new characters who they just killed off instantly it was like what the fuck you know like with lucy lawless you expected her to be in this the the show for the foreseeable future because she's you know someone who's worked um with like like the big hitters like sam raimi um with like we done a couple of times as well so you knew that she was someone that they could use that to kind of stand out and instead they just took her out um mm-hmm. <clears throat> so it is interesting to see what they do and how they're going to do it and how they progress um in terms of this uh amazing show you know it, it's for me i think that at the promising lot agents of shield seems extremely promising um arrow in its own right, it's nice to see someone who was given such a bad rep um, with like uh, Superman, um, which is a uh, uh, Brandon Roth, have him come back. And you know he's playing a different character. He's playing a, uh, I believe it's Ted Cord, isn't it? Uh, yeah, he's he's now running Queen Consolidated, right? Yeah, he, he's basically he's Giant Man, I think he is. He is. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's he's basically um, playing. Uh, a character, a superhero character in his own right, but a different character than who's not Superman. Um, I, I know in the, they, there's currently got going on in the DC, uh, news that they're not linking the films to the TV shows, which I think is a big mistake on their part. I, I think so. You're, you're putting so much build behind these guys and it's, Stephen Amell is fabulous or is fantastic as the arrow yeah i agree and and i think he's someone that really needs to get his his due and and i think as well with the flash they might as well have these two join the league and then go back into the tv verse in a sense because you don't need to keep building all these characters on the screen and uh it was actually <clears throat> it was an, based on an idea that i had because i i pitched an idea to uh warner brothers and dc about bringing the Green Lantern series where you would introduce um, basically the Green Lantern corpse on TV and have um, the the Lantern story arc work its way on film. So you'd eventually build up these two characters so that it would be together in a, in a kind of a huge Green Lantern movie, but still have the corpse going on um, on TV screen. So you'd introduce like Gardner, you'd um, introduce like all the other characters on the television and then you'd have Hal Jordan and eventually his replacement, um, like via the movies. And then eventually you can have them all amalgamate together when it comes to a big, uh, you know, a bigger story arc. And I think currently with all the, the, the reviews and everything coming out in terms of the DC universe and their movies and what they're planning, 
I think everything's going a little too fast. You know? Yeah, they're, they're rushing it to try to catch up with Marvel, and I think if they just, you know, bite the bullet, yeah, we relate to the game. Take your time. Incor- it shows that it works. You can incorporate a TV show into a movie, as Marvel Agents of Shields have done with uh, Winter Soldier. Yeah. It just takes patience, time, and your fan base will thank you, uh, will be more loyal to you if you do it the right way. Yeah, uh, and that's that's the big thing, and I think they, they kind of take the viewing audience as simple and i just don't think that that's the way you need to look at your audience as you know people aren't simple people just if you give people a story they will follow that story look at the fast and furious movies they they followed those from the get-go and people still follow them you know Mm -hmm. they are on their own they don't you can't seem to identify them as much but if you've followed it from the first movie onwards you know, people know what the ongoing story is with this. Um, and, and I think it's, it's just something that DC are kind of missing out on the boat because they, they want to do what Marvel's doing, but they're going the wrong way about it. Mm. Now, um, moving on from that, <clears throat> in, in terms of like your video games, cause this is about, this show is pretty much about you today. And in terms of the games that you like to play, and I know um, you're a big fan of like companies like Naughty Dog, for instance, because you're a huge Crash mm-hmm. Bandicoot fan. I'm pretty sure we started hashtag Bring Back Crash on this show. We we did, yes. <laughs> um, and it's actually quite funny because it's you know I'm as you know I'm a big fan of the indies. I like independent games. Um, I I believe that the next developer is go- you know is someone out there who's like honing their craft. Uh, I recently did a, a couple of interviews at the IP Expo and the Eurogaming Expo, the EGX, which is over here in the UK. And I was talking um, with a bunch of developers about it. And now that's kind of how Naughty Dog started off. Because most people don't know that Naughty Dog kind of started by doing a game on the 3DO that was similar to Mortal Kombat. Hmm, very cool. Um, you know, they, they did the whole like screen capture and everything. And, and they use like friends and family to create these characters. Um, it, and... You know, they, they then, that game made bank basically, and then they moved on to, uh, getting their deal with Sony, and then they created the character of Crash Bandicoot, who was a, a it showed that you could do a 3D platformer right, you know, in, in terms of a, a character themselves, and it built a, a kind of a mascot for Sony. The problem was, there were so many transitions that went through with this, with this character that they ended up, um, moving the the character ended up making his way to Activision, who now hold the rights for Crash Bandicoot, uh, as well as another character that you um you know played, which is Spyro the Dragon, mm-hmm. um, which is now part of the Skylander series. My kids love that fucking series. Uh, <laughs> they 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 literally just said to me, Dad, we want Skylander's Trap Team for Christmas. I was like, okay, I'll sort it out. Don't worry, <laughs> don't hurt me. Yeah, slow down. Christmas is like three months away. Let's get through Halloween. <laughs> yeah, it's just like your sister's birthday's coming up. Um, she's cool because she wants Smash Brothers, so I'm getting that for the Wii U for her. Um, but in terms of those characters, let's start with Crash, for instance. What got you into the Crash Bandicoot series? Because I know you're like a, you're a huge PlayStation fan. It, it, it's it's simple gameplay is what hooks me. I am not the most avid gamer out there. I'm you give me a shooter game, I'm terrible. I have five-year-old, my nephew who's six will pick me off in a distance before I even get to load the gun. Um, the simple map structure of Crash Bandicoot where it's kind of, it, it's kind of a throwback to Mario because it's just a running game from start point A to point B, um, is huge. And the easy controls, the fun character, and the fun nature and backstory of it. So, in terms of like the, the game itself, what kind of, you know, did you have you played from the first game all the way to to the final? I I have gone from definitely I've hit every single one in the PlayStation One era. Uh, I actually think the last game I played was Crash Team Racing, and I didn't realize because I was late to the game when it came to upgrading to this next gen system, which was PS2, and I was late to the game to get into that. So by the time I got a PS2, probably two months later, I had a PS3. That's how late I was. Um. And I just, Crash kind of fell off the radar. And like you said, I think it's about the time they ended up selling Naughty Dog to Activision. And at that time, it just, I didn't follow him as much. And it, the gameplay kind of looked like it changed anyway. Yeah, it, it was one of those things where Naughty Dog, when they made their deal with Sony, they were 
they basically, um, I, I believe he ended up as a property for Vivendi Universal. And when Vivendi ended up buying uh, a stake in Activision, Crash was then transferred over to that property. So when Activision Blizzard kind of made their merge, Activision then bought the remaining rights of their company away from Vivendi Universal. Now Crash is currently sitting in Activision in archives, not doing anything. Um, and I believe there is a hint of Sony trying to gain the property back for the PlayStation 4, but there hasn't been anything going on. Um, so have you played like a uh, crash team racing? Mm-hmm. What, um, what, what did you feel that was that a game that kind of you found was similar in vain to Mario Kart? It, it did sound like it was Sony's answer to Mario Kart. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, just because all you get to play as all the crash characters, which was fun, gave it a new story where he was fighting a new villain. And at the same time, uh, I was a Sony guy. I didn't have N64 or, uh, I didn't get the GameCube for a while, so I didn't have a Mario Kart, and that, to me, that was my Mario Kart. So, um, how did you find with that? Was it was it one of those games that you enjoyed wholeheartedly? It, yeah, I think so, and I, I think the testament to that game is the fact that I, I would I probably, after we get done recording this, I'll go play it now because we're talking about it. it it's got that replay value. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the, the main thing that I find that game, a lot of games today don't really have that. You know, they, they kind of, they don't have that, that main replay value. I know the big game at the moment is Alien Isolation and people like it's a return to survival horror. Yeah, it's great. And I've asked the majority of people who've played it, would you play it again? And they're like, no, because mm. you get what you get out of the game and that's it. Um, you do have the exception to the rule, of course, because I know you're currently playing Destiny. That I see, I like that game, and the reason I like Destiny is, um, and when I've described this to people, a it's like Halo. Uh, I never had an Xbox or anything like that, so I, I know it's the same designers as Halo. I may be wrong. Correct. Yeah. Um, and to them, I just said it's an easier version of Call of Duty. Yeah. I am terrible at Call of Duty, and Destiny allows me to have a pretty much an even playing field. It's true because um, I'm kind of one of those as well that I hate FPS shooters. And I hate MMOs. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, but with this, it's kind of, it combines the two elements together. And plus, I like playing the Warlock. So I've got the gun and I've got the, the fucking magical power in my hand. Yeah. So, um, if I can't hit someone with my gun, I'm just going to go straight to their face and just like blast them. Exactly. And that's, that's what I play as too. It, it's, it's easier for me. Call of Duty, I am, I'm just screwed. I can't get off the spawning point. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. And I, and I think when it comes to stuff like this, um, in games like this, uh, a lot of people I've, I've got up in arms about it, and I've got a review coming up with myself and Rob Man talking about this game. And one of the things people have an issue with is the fact that when you play the game itself, there's no much the much story to it. And they the issue is, well, we want like a single player mode as well as a um, you know a, a two player mode or like a, a multiplayer mode. And what they've done is they've allowed this game to rely itself wholly on its online play. Um, and it's great. And, and the leveling up on it as well is, is extremely weird because you only go up to level 20 and then you have to use your armor to level you up even further. So like mm-hmm. from the light core armor, then you go basically for the legendary armor to get up to level 30. Um, and you're doing like crucible missions. You do player versus player. And there's so much in it. I, I've believed I've played over 60 hours so far on this game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I heard a lot of people complain that the fact that it's repetitive. I, I can't see how. I mean, I, I see the elements of the repetition, but yeah. at the same time, it, you, you're still playing it. So they're doing something right. Yeah, of course. And and I think as well, um, as Rob was saying, if people have a problem, Bungie have a forum. You know, they, they basically, these guys will listen to people because they've they've listened before. You know, they they've sat down and people said i have a problem with x y and z they then take that on board they see if the the mechanics that they're talking about work or don't work and then they go in there and they and they just sort it out and that's the great thing about having that kind of face to face with bungie you've got that 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 form there where they will listen to people and they will um you know make any changes if people bark loud enough about it so and plus, as well, do, do you have like an issue? Because I know a lot of people have an issue with the fact that you have to purchase um, a subscription with them. Like it's forty bucks, 
um, I believe £35 here in the UK. And that gives you all the add-on content for it for that year because I know they've got a 10-year plan. So I don't know if it's you've got to pay 35 a year or if it's just going to be a one-off. Um, but it's uh, people have been complaining about that. It's like, oh, you know, oh, I don't, I don't want that. Um, whereas for me, I'm more, I, I enjoy that. I, I think it's going to be um, something quite. I, I think with the extra bits and pieces, it's going to make the game even more expansive. I, I think it's a good idea. Uh, rather than what like Injustice, Marvel vs. Capcom, those guys have re-released the game. And being someone who collects them and is not a big fan of trading them back in for like half the price I paid it for, yeah. I collect the games. And if they're just going to keep continuing building the online universe and I get to use the same disc, go for it. I am all for that. Yeah, and that's uh, that's the main thing as well. And I think with, with what most of these companies do, they do like they release the game, then they do the DLC, and then they release the Ultimate Edition. And you're mm-hmm. sitting there thinking, what the fuck? You know, I've already paid for this game, and now I've got to buy it again. Um. But with Bungie, what they're doing, they're trying to make it work a lot better. And, and you know, with this, with the tweaking, the the fact that it's so submersive, you know, I've, I love playing this game. And whenever I have downtime, that's the first thing I do. I turn on my PlayStation 3 and I give it a shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same with me. It's it's the game I go to. Uh, I feel guilty because I picked up Destiny. Like, all right, I reserved Shadows of Mordor and picked up Destiny at the same time. And I just lent out Shadows of Mordor because I know I'm not going to get to it anytime soon. Yeah, um, the one issue that I've had with Shadows of Mordor at the moment, there's there's been a big issue happening in terms of have you, have you followed like Gamergate? Um, basically, it's a a movement that's currently going on about corrupt journalism. Um, a lot of it, and and I was actually just reading a uh, article on Bayonetta 2, which has been released on the the Wii U. Currently, I think we'll be getting it in the next couple of weeks here in the UK. Um, the United States are, are getting it as well, ASAP. But one of the sites that has been alleged um, as being very corrupt, um, which is uh, Polygon, because they had a journalist who ended up having an affair with a gamer that he reviewed her game, mm-hmm. um, gave the game a 7.5 out of 10. Just because he was having an affair with her? Well, more of the fact that they're very kind of, they're on Anita Sarkeesian's level of thing, thinking, mm-hmm. which is, oh, it's misogynistic that a woman is, is barely having any clothes on when the main game designer behind the game is actually a woman. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I'll just leave it to the actually playing it myself. Game, game reviews are very tough for me, because yeah. they usually, like I said, I'm not a, a full-blown gamer, so it's more of a whatever just, can get me in sucked into it and out of reality for a while. Then you've sold me. Yeah, that does the same thing for me. I'm the the way I I like to do things is play my games and see how they go. And and the the thing about games for me is I either want a good immersive story or I want excellent gameplay. Nine times out of ten, you're never going to get both. Um, mm-hmm. I think there, there's an exception to the rule with GTA Five, um, because I played the fucking hell out of that. You know. <laughs> Uh, and it, it's literally, it's, it's one of those games where I can sit down and it's got a great um, single player campaign and it's got an even more amazing uh, multiplayer campaign, you know, and, and like with GTA Online. So it allows you to have so much to it. You know, I'm a big stickler for like the Pokemon games as well. Mm-hmm. And the story is pretty much the same. Ten year old kid, parents say, yeah, go fucking catch a Pokemon and and do shit. Um, and then you're, you're, you're spending your life trying to fucking become the greatest Pokemon champion ever while your mum doesn't even worry about you. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's fun to play. You know, it's one of those where I, 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 I have to admit I've been trying to catch them all. Um, <laughs> and as I've been playing X and Y, and I'm, I'm gonna, probably going to get Ruby Sapphire, uh, when that comes out. And it is very cut and paste. It's like, you know, what, where else can you go? What else can you do? Um, and it, it's it, it's so good, but for for yourself, for instance, what kind of brought you onto um, an, another game we're we're looking at, Spyro the Dragon? What what made you want to do Spyro? Uh, again, I, I think it's the the simple controls, and when you're a kid, these characters are easy to gravitate to. And Spyro was around the same time as Crash, and being a Sony guy, I had Spyro and 
I didn't have the 64 that had Yoshi, Mario, Star Fox, all those guys, like the well-established names. And he was new. It was cool. Collecting the gems was fun, running around, soaring, and then he kept getting more powers as each game came along, more characters. I felt, I'm going to be honest, I fell out of love when the Skylanders came out and when he started looking a little funky. But the classic Spyro, I still play to this day, and it's another one with a replay value. The the funny thing about the Spyro and Skylanders, because it, it they used him to kind of sell the game when the first one came out. It mm-hmm. was like um, Skylanders Spyro's Adventure. Mm-hmm. And then they just changed the title for the second game, which was Skylanders. And, um, you know, my, my kids love collecting those toys. It's introduced Spyro to a, another... Um, kind of audience. It's, it's, I'm kind of like you. I don't mind playing it when I'm with the kids, but I probably wouldn't pick it up and go, oh, Skylanders, let's play. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of like that Disney Infinity game. Yeah. It's, which I think is got their inspiration from Spyro. I probably did that backwards. Yeah, they, they did. They got it from, um, the, um, basically from Skylanders. And it's, it's, as I said, good game. Uh, one of those that I, I considerably, like to play with the minions, but I think they need like four player on those. That's the one thing I hate about those games. They don't have four player. Um, but in the end, it, it's still one of those games that, you know, it, I can see the reason why they utilize that property to kind of springboard this like new thing as well. And plus, if you're a game collector out there, you know that you would enjoy these types of games. Mm-hmm. Because uh, a lot of people do like to collect figures and stuff like that as well. That's why uh, Nintendo have taken it another way and decided to release things called Amiibos, uh, which you can integrate into Mario Kart 8 and into um, Smash Brothers and loads of other games as well. So you get to use this one figure that you can actually cross-platform into other games on your 3DS and your Wii U. Um, speaking of Mario Kart 8, you've played it. What do you think of it? I love it. It, it felt like... Uh... Playing the older game, they they threw in a few new elements. I miss the old battle element, but it, it's definitely a it's a party game, and I think we have fewer and fewer of those that where you can get a bunch of people together and have tournaments and have fun and just let loose in a simple racing racing game that includes Mario uh, characters. And that's the thing they they've kind of expanded it now. Are you going to be getting the uh, downloadable content for it? It's like eleven bucks. Uh, <laughs> you get like Link. And Animal Crossing characters and um, some specialist characters as well. The the funny story behind that is I was uh, misled by a former co-host on the Dace Man Show, Dan Raup, and he said, "Oh, you can get it now. I, I've already pre-ordered it." So yes, I I will be having at least the the Zelda Legend of Zelda collection added. I don't know about the uh, I think it was the Villagers. Yeah, the did village you one? did you pay for both or did you just pre-order the first one? Just pre-ordered The Legend of Zelda. I didn't want those other figures clogging it up. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's for me, it's, it's one of those things where I, you know, with the DLC and stuff, and they've, they've even added like these Mercedes-Benz cars, which makes the races a lot more better as well, mm-hmm. um, which are kind of the free LC that they've added onto the game. And it's, it, you know, being a Mario Kart fan myself, from the Super Nintendo all the way to the Wii U, I've played every iteration of this game. And, and thanks to Steve Benway, who's a friend of my YouTube channel and a friend of this show as well, um, he allowed me to actually give like a have a one-on-one with Mario Kart 7. And mm-hmm. oh, it's, it's so good. I've even played the arcade versions that Namco Bandai did with Nintendo as part of the Triforce um, series. And it's, it's a great, great concept. I love the racing games. And, and you're right, it's a great party game because I always make my nephew cry every time I beat him. Uh, <laughs> I hate you! He's like, yes, alright, it's fine. How could you beat me? I was the faster one! I just know technique, Sunshine. I know technique. Um, and, I, and I've played a couple of times. It's it's a great game, and it's still one of those games that I can still pick up. You know, Luckily enough, in the UK, we got the special edition bundle, so I got the blue shell, um, a free t-shirt, key ring, and also the the game itself, and, I, and Nintendo being as nice as they've been, have given me two copies of the game. So I got the downloadable copy and the disc copy. Mm, very cool. Um, yeah, and I got like a couple of free games as well with it. Um, it's just all due to the fact that they messed up. So yeah. <laughs> um, going, you know, on, onto that one. I know you're one of the the owners of the Wii U, and a lot of people have been sitting there like trashing the system. Um, because we always have the gamer debates of Xbox versus PlayStation versus Nintendo. 
And would you consider Nintendo a, a good gaming system for you? Because I know you like to, you do like to play like Super Mario World. Um, when you were doing the the Dace Man plays mm-hmm. um, uh, as well, it took a while to get to being a good system again. Um, when I'll I'll openly admit, when I first bought it, I was cursing it because it had nothing. There was nothing for me to do. I bought it. It sat and collected dust in my basement. Um, now that it's got Mario Kart, the new Hyrule Warriors, which is phenomenal. Um, the Super Mario Brothers, there's an Avengers game. There's Smash Brothers coming out. They announced Star Fox, a new Kirby. It's like, okay, now you got your, your wheels turning, and I, I'm back in Nintendo. Because there was a brief moment in the Sony history of the Dace Man that I did have a GameCube. And then I did play Wii, and now I was like, you know what? Wii you, why not? Because uh, the Wii was my sister's, and I figured I'll buy my own, why not upgrade to Wii U? And then it didn't come out with anything. Yeah, it was the same thing when I bought it, because I bought it on day of release, and um, I got Nintendo Land. Luckily enough, I waited to get a few of the games on pre-owned, like I got Arkham City um, on it as well, and Tank 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 and a few others, and uh, I played kind of fast and loose with it. I know I got the Skylander games and stuff for it as well. Um, but as soon as Mario Kart 8 came out, that was it. I was playing like crazy. Me and the kids did our own little Let's Play on, on Mario 3D World, uh, which I managed to get for free. School! Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and it, it was like, a real fun time that I had with them. And I find with that console, I find that's the console of choice with the little ones. Whereas the, the Xbox and the PlayStation are consoles I like to play. You know, they're stuff that I can play on my own with friends, um, online. But the local stuff is always the Wii U, and I'm, it's a shame though as well. They don't do online play very well. Mm-hmm. It, it's clear that Nintendo has definitely uh, taken a page of the WWE's book and said, you know what, we're a kid system. We're marketed to kids. Kids will bring us the most money because they'll bug the hell out of their parents. Let's just keep focusing on them. Yeah, and it, and it seems to be working, um, you know, really, really well. Now. Moving on to on from that as well, what, which is your favorite system that you like to play? Currently? Yeah. Uh, it's got to be, even though I own the PS4, the PS3, I have over 60 games. I still go back to it, um, and I probably spend the most time on it. Me and that PS3 have been through a, we've been through a lot, some memories. Um, so speaking of the PS3... There's a game that's exclusive on the PlayStation um, that you've played. Um, do you own a PS4, by the way? I do. I did upgrade. Um, it was a glorified Netflix machine for the first couple months, but I upgraded it for a reason, and I think I know why where we're going, and it's probably because of what you're going to say. Infamous. <laughs> yep, that's why I upgraded. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to get one for the second son myself, but when I found out it wasn't coming on the day of release, I, I cancelled my order. Um, and, and I was going to go for Watch Dogs as well, which, um, I'm glad I didn't because I played it on the 360 and I spent 60 hours of my life on this game that was just completely monotonous and ridiculous. Um, but you know, everyone knows my feelings on Watch Dogs, so we don't have to keep a <laughs> uh, I, I, I will curse the day that game ever got made. Um, but Infamous, what attracted you to that game? Because it's, it's a game where you get a chance to either be the hero or the villain. You've got superpowers, you've been given this amazing ability, but you can have uh, a chance to either do good or do bad. And you're playing a character, I believe his name's Cole McGrath? Uh, for the first two, yes. Yeah. Three. For two and a half. Yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about that. What, what kind of attracted you to that game? Th- that was really a, a stumble upon that sunk in and stuck um i remember it, i think it was like it was really cheap at gamestop i was on this buying frenzy i got my tax check from the government it's like let's go spend this money on stuff i don't need and i picked up that game and picking it up uh the second one had already come out so i picked up the first one and it was like whew, this is this is amazing and since then it, i've bought it as a gift uh the franchise is a gift for uh, my brother and a friend vic it's like hey this is a good game. Get into it, um, and I like the fact it, it get they did it. They took a path that gives it replay value. There's so much to do in the map. Uh, there's so many different. It's a button mashing game at certain points, and once you finish it, you're not done. You're only fifty percent done, and you'd have to go back and do it all over again. So that was always a hooking point, and the storytelling was amazing. 
Yeah, because you you follow him throughout this journey, and they took a big risk as well with at the end of Infamous Two. And spoilers again, guys, they they killed Cole off. Yeah. Why? I mean, you, you, you had the option if you played it the evil way, he stayed alive, but he was evil. Uh, the way that the the studios went and said, "Hey, like eighty percent of the people decided to have him die like a noble hero." That's the storyline we're sticking with. Yeah. And then they moved on for the PlayStation 4 to Second Son, which, again, it, it kind of balances that story out a little bit more. But you, you play a new character. Nothing, this guy has nothing to do with Cole whatsoever. It, it, it touches on the legacy. And the cool thing that came with the downloadable content was Cole's legacy. Yeah. Uh, they, For those of you that – it's kind of a spoiler, but if you play uh, Second Son, Zeke returns – and he sends the new character on missions that pretty much gives you a little bit more information into Cole's life and the legacy he leaves behind. And, and also it shows there's a different, like, time frame as well because they've, they, they've kind of did the same thing that they did, um, in the sense of like the Ghostbusters movies, if that makes sense, where yeah. they would, one minute the whole world's like, yay, you saved us! And then they've now got this government task force that's going out there to kind of kill anybody with these special abilities, kind of try and stop them. You know, if you're not with them, they'll just take you and take your powers. Um, so what was that like? What was like playing that instance of the game? Because I know the graphics were amazing because it was a different – graphically, it was a different system. Oh, it was phenomenal, the, 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 the detail that went into all these characters. And again, they told a hell of a story. Um, and that really is what hooks me from now and then. And yeah, that's the main thing as well, because games never used to tell much of a story. If you look back from the from the sixteen bit and the eight bit era, um, they they had kind of their own variations of what a story would be. Like, um, and the next game we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit from the sixteen bit era. Um, that kind of hasn't still hasn't made that adjustment, um, and. Nowadays, though, they rely a lot more on storytelling to get these games over, it, you know, whether good or bad. Some of them have been really terrible. Others have been really, really great. Now, one from the 16 bit era that didn't require much storytelling and is a game that keeps going and going and going for every iteration. Uh, currently, there's a new one that's out called Sonic Boom, uh, which is exclusive to the Wii U system. And that's Sonic the Hedgehog. So it, what made you fall in love with Sonic? It- Again, when it comes to like these old classic systems, uh, Sega was the first one that I could call my own. Um, we had a family NES system, but Sega was the one that says, oh, that's Chris's Sega. And Sonic was the first game, Sonic, uh, the original Sonic the Hedgehog. Then I got the second one, then I got the third one, then I got Sonic and Knuckles. And it was just, it was also, it was a lot of fun. When they went over to the Dreamcast, that's when I lost my, my basis with Sonic. But the original games from Sonic, uh, Spinball, all that, I was hooked. It's a childhood thing, and it's more or less a nostalgia factor. Well, I, I have to admit, though, the, the Dreamcast games are pretty cool. Sonic Adventure and Adventure 2 uh, were groundbreaking games. But I think it was the, the one that lost me was um, Sonic 2006. That just... And, you know, the, the, the whole bestiality thing going on as well, just, it, it didn't, right, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's, it was interesting. Um, the, the, the game itself, it, it's, the animation, more or less, has grown to the point where Knuckles looks like he's on roids, but has these little chicken legs now. Yeah. Um, he, he's on something, man. He must be drinking some of that Dwayne Rock Jump yeah. juice. Tails has injected them in the ass with some needles or something like that. But it's, it's, the gameplay they tried to adapt to what was happening in the world around it. And I think, like you said, 2006, when it started to get into this weird environment type scenarios, and I remember playing a few for the GameCube, it just felt weird. It didn't feel like a Sonic game to me. And then, uh, they released Sonic Generations, which sucked me back in. Cause you could either play it the 2D way, the, the way we loved it in the old school, or you could play the map the 3D way where you're running kind of Crash Bandicoot style forward, like a first person. Yeah, and it, with that game as well, I enjoyed that wholeheartedly. It was one of those where um, I got it for, I believe it was three years ago for Father's Day. 
Um, I can't believe the game's three years old. It's, yeah. it's one of those where it's so enjoyable. It brings back that whole nostalgia feeling to it as well. And it has the right, it has the, the, the right kind of nostalgia with the right kind of new elements incorporated into it. I think it's, if you could compare it to any game, I'd compare it to Super Mario 3D World, which mm-hmm. does exactly that. Every single song, every single thing that you play has the same elements that you've come to love, like, uh, Escape from the City, um, my son's, one of my son's favorite Sonic Mute tunes. Um, I bought him a Sonic MP3 player, Teddy, mm-hmm. and, uh, the plush, he presses the button on it and it will play that song. He drives everyone nuts in the household because <laughs> I'm a Sonic where he's like, running around at the speed of sound. He's like running around the house with it. Um, but it's, it's one of those where it's distinguishable. And I, and I think with the character as well, Sonic has done a hell of a lot of good things, but at the same time, whenever you play a lot of these new games, because Sega tend to rush things, they, they throw like a wrench into their own work and, and kind of, they, they make him in, in a sense into a cash cow that people, they know people will buy, so sometimes the games aren't been that good, and I think they, they kind of redeem themselves with generations, um, they did all right with the new one. Uh, what was that one? The Frightful Four. That was Sonic. Um, oh, what was it on the Wii U? It's the first Sonic game to be released on the Wii U. Yeah, he he also he was in a Link uh, outfit and stuff like they had a downloadable yeah. pack where you ran through High Rule. I, I know the game you're talking about, but I can't think of the damn title. Yeah, um, I think it's Sonic and the Lost Worlds. Mm-hmm. Um, they had a Yoshi pack and they had a Link pack to it as well. Um, and then they, they're now releasing Sonic Boom, um, which I haven't heard many good things about the game. Um, but again, I, I will buy it, play it, see what it's like. Um, and he's also a character that's kind of ingrained himself with Nintendo. They've had like the Sonic versus Mario at the Olympic Games. Um, and also now having most Sonic games being first party on Nintendo platforms only. It's really weird. You know, I remember, as you said, you've been a Sega guy all this time. Having that partnership with Nintendo must freak you out a little bit. A little bit. I mean, I, I think it made it real that he was a Nintendo guy when he made his debut in Smash Brothers. It's like, all right. Because I, I, a game that I don't have on my list of faves, but it was a game that was my childhood, was Metal Gear Solid. So when Snake made his debut in Smash Brothers, it's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I marked out for that one. Yeah, it's like Nintendo rules the world. <laughs> Um, so go segue in on that as well. We're going to be, um, just let you know, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go on a, a little bit of a break in a second, uh, after we talk about this game. Um, but it's one which I find looking at your list is kind of the odd one out. You've got a couple of PC games here, mm-hmm. uh, which is Starcraft, Diablo, but you also yes. have a point and click adventure on here, which usually most people wouldn't talk about this, but this game is kind of single handedly brought back point and click. Um, and that game is the walking dead. It's the telltale game version. What drew you to that? I'm a huge fan of The Walking Dead. Uh, you'll see through the channel surfing videos, they're the longest because I, I truly immerse myself into that world. I've read all the comics. I'm up to date. I think it's like issue 116. I'm up to date on the the um, TV show. I sat at New York Comic Con in that hurdle area where they cattle everybody and watched a big screen for The Walking Dead panel. So to expand the universe outside of The Walking Dead we know – but somewhat incorporate into The Walking Dead. There's a for those of you who play it, I'll let you guys figure it out. It was interesting. The story is great, and it kind of lets you live in the moment as to what would you do in the zombie apocalypse. As uh, in the first for uh, the season one, as Lee who stumbles upon this girl and now you're her protector, and then in season two, which I'm currently playing, where now you're that girl that Lee protected in season one. Yeah, and and you know there there are. Um, a few situations in terms of, of what kind of segue from, from season one to season two. Um, and we find out basically his fate as well in that mm-hmm. season. But the story seems to stand out on its own. And, you know, Telltale have done something which most game companies have never done. They've taken a simple format and they've just put them together. You know, they, they, they've allowed that to, um, bring about the, that they focused a lot more on story and they allowed you to make the choices and help build the characters. Whereas most games don't want to help you do that. They, they kind of, you know, like, like a few games we're going to be talking about in a little bit. They would rather 
have you um, rely on like button mashing or following like a, a linear perspective, whereas The Walking Dead gives you choices. Yeah. Um, plus the graphics are pretty good as well. It's like it's a very unique game in itself and still allows you to, to kind of immerse yourself in it. Um, with that, you know, do you feel that that, that story itself, uh, assists the, 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 the ongoing story that's currently in the, the TV show and the comic books? I think with the uh, the games, they're they're way behind at where they're at the TV show right now. Yeah, there was that one minor link that showed that the season one of the Telltale game series was prior to the show and the yeah. comics, um, which was nice. It shed a little bit of light, and it was interesting because um, if you look at the series, everybody in the show and the comics, they head west from Atlanta. Uh, in the game, you're heading east towards savannah uh and then eventually it looks like in season two you're heading a little bit north so far from what i've gotten to and then the guys in the comics are heading to the north so it'll be interesting to see they intertwine because if you're a fan of the comics and have an idea where the show's going it's very uh conceivable that the people within the game could eventually cross paths in washington with those of the show and comic and I'm also very interested to see Telltale's work because they're, they're going to be releasing a Game of Thrones version uh, very soon. So they did amazing with Walking Dead. I'm, I'm interested to see what they do with that. What do you think about Survival Instinct? Because I know a lot of people panned that game. I, I started playing it, you know, being a fan of Daryl and him being a uh, character that was not in the comic and being a fan of Mer- Merle especially. It was interesting to see what their backstory would be. Um I didn't get very far in it. I'm, I'm, I'm a bad person when it comes to games because I'll buy a bunch, start playing one, take a break, and then I start another one. And I never really get through too much. So if I get a through your game, it's a testament that you have a very, very good game. You've hooked me. Um, and I think it's about the time I started playing that and then I got into another infamous game. And that's when I lost it. Well, you know what? I, I know exactly how you feel in comes of stuff like that because I'm the same way. Uh, when I'm playing a game, I have to play the full game, um, all the way through it. Otherwise I, I leave it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, you never know. It, it's, when it comes to, with that game, I, I've heard some bad things. I know Angry Joe did a review on it, talking about the fact that it's extremely monotonous. It seems like a cash cow. And as Telltale games tend to kind of lean away from the cash cow, because they don't use any established characters, mm-hmm. they, they use the name to kind of build up a new set of people. And their own stories. Survival Instincts tries to say, "Oh, look, look! These are these guys. This is what they've done." You know, yay! Um, they've got the voices, and it just it it doesn't really kind of help the game itself. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to do? I'm going to put on a nice little song of choice here. So we're going to let uh, Mr. Chris Dace here pick a song uh, that we're going to play as we go on the break, and we'll be back in a couple of minutes. So, Dace, what would you like us to play for you? Anything? Like, that's way too much power. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, we'll do it. We'll play some chip tune and we'll be right back, guys, after this. Ahead, fade in my hands today. 
And we're back, ladies and gentlemen, uh, with more from uh, our special guest here, Chris the Dace Man Dace. Hey! So, um, we're basically continuing our look into Dace's favourite games, of course, as well. Uh, Dace being a video game collector, uh, host, entrepreneur, and entertainer in his own right. Um, kind of mirroring myself, of course. Uh, has a, a very nice list of games, and he kind of... Uh, it's actually quite funny when we look at the the games that you've had and what you've kind of had partial to, because we, we kind of have the same tasting games, but at the same level, you kind of became... You were more of a uh, kind of a Sega guy in terms of the first console you owned, where I was more of a Nintendo guy. Um, but there are very similar games that we've uh, basically enjoyed as well. Now... Focusing on a game that kind of has that whole uh, bullet time, quick time event uh, to it, and that's God of War. So tell us a little bit about God of War. What what makes you interested in that game? What what did you enjoy about it? Uh, Greek mythology has always uh, intrigued me when it comes to the, the stories and their gods and all the history behind that. And for a game to be called God of War, it it definitely piqued my interest, um, and it, it, the picture on the thing not being Ares. It's Kratos. Uh, if you look at every game, it's always Kratos staring at something. And for him to take that journey to become the God of War and then fall from grace and then return to try to get back uh, at the Titans and stuff like that, it's it's a phenomenal storytelling. And, and I think when it comes to most games, the storytelling is what sells me the most. It's a rather interesting story because... He was someone who was loyal to the gods and would do their bidding. He was loyal to Ares and then became someone who went against them because they betrayed him ultimately. Mm -hmm. So um, tell us a little bit about that. What kind of hooked you in in terms of that story? It was very interesting. Here's a, here's a guy that um, went to war. And a war is something that Ares needs to be a god of war. If there's no war, then there's no god of war. Um, and Kratos, on his, like, last leg, make, strikes a deal with Ares, and Ares tricks him into murdering his family. And from there, it, it's interesting, because now, how is he, he is now hitting rock bottom after selling his soul to the god of war. How is he going to redeem himself? And what better way than killing the god of war himself? And he finds a very rather unique way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Then, eventually he gets thrown into this whole different story arcs, you know, like Zeus takes away his powers. Yeah, it, it's it's very interesting to see what happens because in the first game, all the gods are with you. Let's All right, let's kick Ares' his ass. Kratos gets up to the god of war and becomes a god himself, and then pretty much all the other gods turn on him like they did on Ares. And Zeus knocks him down, and now... <laughs> You, you've messed with me. Kratos is going to come climbing the mountain. He's going to take care of Zeus. And in doing so, he, he just, he pulls from so much more Greek mythology. Now he's got the Titans involved. Now he's got this involved. And now you're at the point where, okay, the Titans are involved. How are we going to uh, show that the Titans? How am I going to stop them? With Kratos' journey, what did you find, like, in, in terms of character development, did you find it satisfying the way that it eventually ended? Uh, yeah, I think so, for the most part. Kratos was a great character. You can definitely get some good movies. If you want to transition a game to a movie, I would shut up and take my money. Uh, the, the story is so powerful and, and, like, captivating that I think you can make the cut gameplay as simplistic as you want. The story is just, it's what keeps you going. What's going to happen next? That's the kind of thing that got you hooked as well, because... Well, I was talking about the gameplay mechanics. Mm -hmm. You look at someone like Kratos, and you've got the quick time events that go on every time that you're playing. Mm -hmm. That kind of builds the game to itself. But the great thing about it is that you don't mind it as much because the story is so good. Yeah, it's it's quick time events and some of the the puzzles that were a pain in the ass. Uh, would usually be a turn off to me if it was a game that was going nowhere. Tomb Raider. I, I enjoy some of them, but some of the stories aren't strong enough for me to keep playing. And they do similar things to, that, uh, God of War does. Um, God of War, ha and it's probably just because I'm biased because of the Greek mythology, had me so immersed in their universe, I wanted to keep going. As annoying as shit some of those puzzles were, 
I, I wanted to keep going. I wanted to see what was going to happen to Kratos. Again, though, it's it's basically they built it on a character that never existed in Greek mythology. Mm-hmm. And they made these whole new stories with this character. It's pretty much similar as what Telltale did. And they used Greek mythology as kind of a, a base to build his story. Without a doubt. I am bet I would be a betting man to say that when this studio went in to make this game, they probably thought it was going to be a one and done. Not a game where the fans are consistently begging them to, I need another one. I need another one. He's dead. I don't care. You figure out a way to bring him back. I need another one. Yeah, because they did do one afterwards after they ended the story. Mm-hmm. Talking about his time in between. Uh, I believe it was a PSP game. Mm-hmm. That was like Chains of Gods or something, or Chains of Olympus. Yeah. Yeah. No. It, 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 go ahead. No, no, go for it. Uh, it, it. Like I said, it's the story. Pulling off of Greek mythology, it's always fun. You always hear the story of Hercules. You always hear the story of like Icarus and stuff like that. They they took a book, they rewrote it, and they they had a man try to change his destiny. And it's it's just amazing. It's captivating. I, I really think any game to succeed that's not just pull up a gun and shoot things, you need to have a story. And well played with uh, God of War. And the funny thing is, who did they get to voice Hercules? Oh, I don't remember. Kevin Sorbo. Oh, yeah, I never realized that. Yeah, um, I only realized that when I was actually um, looking at the cut sequence, and then I looked at the end credits, I was like, Kevin Sorbo voiced Hercules. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew that they were fans of the of the Raimi universe in the sense that he created. And again, another person who took Greek mythology and made it his own. Yeah, without a doubt. And like I said, storytelling to the T. If more games put that much in-depth to detail, reasoning, and motivation for a character, holy crap, it, it's it's a great series. Now... Moving on from that, and a game that kind of ties in itself with, with Spyro and Crash, because it was made by ultimately by Blizzard, who have one of the most successful MMOs out there, World of Warcraft. They had a game that they created called StarCraft, and a game that's on your, your basically your 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 favorite games list here. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. What kind of intrigues you about that game? Uh, I think StarCraft. Um. It's really the first game that was a multiplayer game for me. Um, my first PC experience, okay, second, uh, if you want to include Maniac Mansion for the Commodore 64. But it, it's it's the first time that I engaged on online play with my friends. And remember fighting with my mom and dad. Let me stay up another hour. I want to finish this game. We're, we're, we've got cannon defense and we're trying to protect our bases. And it's just, it, it was something that really bonded, uh, especially the co-host of the Days Man show. Me and Gibby really bonded over this game, and it, it held value. I played that game for years. Years that, like, Blizzard was releasing World of Warcraft. They, re- they released the, all kinds of other games, and I still played Brood War because it was so much fun. So what made this game timeless for you? Was it because of the interaction that you had with your friends on this game? Or do you feel that the game itself aged very um, uniquely? I, I think it aged very uniquely. Um, the, the whole... Uh, God, I can't think of... The, the battle net. The whole battle net concept was fantastic. Um, whereas, yeah, the gameplay is pretty much one and done in like maybe four or five hours if you go through the campaign. But there was endless online experiences. And I think the interaction of being able to say, hey... Gibby, Dan, let's let's get on the show. Let's get on the computer. Let's get a bag of chips, a six pack of coke, and let's fuck it. Let's just do this. And we're gonna we're gonna defend all the towers. And we would like my eyes would hurt. I just the, the experience of how long and in depth I went with this game. It's just it's the nostalgia effect. And the next when the Blizzard finally released a sequel to StarCraft, you bet your ass I was right there at the door banging on like, come on. I want this game. I gotta have this game. I don't know if it held up as great as the first one because now I'm 26. But when I was uh, 12 to 14 playing this game or whatever, however old I was, it was phenomenal. It was my 
break from reality and a chance to be with my friends on and an online capability. Speaking of Blizzard, though, continuation, um, they released another game called Diablo, which, again, is on your um, favorites list here. Have you played Diablo 3? Yes. Uh, th- this is a game where uh, I think it's kind of opposite of StarCraft. I-, I really love the original StarCraft and Brood War. Diablo 2 was phenomenal as well. That was one like, all right, I like StarCraft, let me try this. Um, but Diablo 3... And especially going uh, the console route with Diablo 3, it was phenomenal. I, I have it for PS4, I have it for my PC. I I love it on the PS4. It, I am not the quickest uh, person on a keyboard when it comes to mapping keys and such, but put a, a PlayStation 4 controller in my hand, and I'm unstoppable. Um, it's it's another one of those with a great story, too. Uh, you're, you're taking on Diablo, like, the whole devil and a lore of religion and stuff like that and fighting the undead. It's a great story. And it was a little different from Star, uh, Starcraft. It, to me, it's an in-between. There's Starcraft, there's Diablo, and there's Warcraft uh, when it comes to the variations of the game. I never took that full jump to Warcraft, but Diablo was enough of a step for me to still stay hooked. So expanding on that, you then have... Uh, another game that kind of breaks from the norm, but it's another one of my favorites. I played it on the PSP religiously. Um, and they have a, a semblance of it with Marvel online at the moment that they're doing, um, which is Marvel Ultimate Alliance. So tell us a little bit about that. What kind of hooked you on that one? I, I think it's uh, it kind of like The Walking Dead. I'm a huge fan of the comics. I, I have an off a work office at home that's just filled and littered with comics. I need another uh freaking shelf for all the comics I have and they took major storylines and let us play them out um, obviously the second one being around the Civil War storyline and then the first one having a lot of the Secret War and all kinds of different storylines mashed into one like hey here's the Marvel Universe bam let's shove it in your face and then the second one being here's Civil War good guy versus good guy um, I'm still hoping they come out with a, a third one which will be Avengers vs. X-Men it's kind of like Civil War but they're two different storylines too and you get two different teams you can either be the X-Men or Avengers two huge franchises that I've we've all loved um and the four character was unique you got to build your own team um you know you'd have Deadpool teaming with Thor and teaming with uh Black Panther and you know the back there Miss Marvel it, it's like you had such a huge team up right there which was phenomenal and it, the story is another thing because I'm a huge comic book fan so, what do you think currently what's going on in the Marvel Universe? Have you read up the, the new, like, um, story arts, including Axis and Death of Wolverine, etc.? Um, I have not picked up Death of Wolverine, because I didn't want to sit on the edge of my seat every, week after week waiting. I will get the, the collected edition. Um, but I, I got the opportunity at New York Comic Con, which is kind of cool, kind of a neat little tie-in here, uh, to do the panel called A Cup of, jo- uh, a Cup, Cup of Joe with Joe Quesada where he brought on a lot of his writing team, his editors, the people that are working on the big projects. And I'm very excited because I I got into Marvel now. I feel like it was slower. I understand why they were rebooting it because they're trying to link everything and give the casual viewer of the movies more information that someone like you or I that have read way back into the history understand. Um, And then even it's got to be annoying as hell to those that started with Marvel way back then. Um, but it's all leading to a secret wars. And then I keep getting these emails and I keep seeing things popping up on the email, uh, popping up on the internet that, you know, there's going to be a civil war. Number one, a house of M number one, the age of Ultron versus Marvel zombies all coming out next summer. So they've piqued my interest. I am definitely interested to see where they're going to go. Uh, and Casada and his team at the New York comic con really hyped it up. Well, um, to the point where I've kind of slowed from buying comics, and now I feel like I'm really far behind. Yeah, they've they've done something because um, I, I believe they're doing another event, um, which oh, what was it called? Um, it's something they used to do regularly, Secret Wars. Um, Secret Wars with the yeah. with the Beyonder. Um, they're doing that. And apparently the Civil War tie-in, the Avengers vs. X-Men tie-in, and all the other little bits 
are tying into that. So you're going to have Marvel characters versus Marvel characters versus Ultimate Marvel characters. Um, you know, I've been reading up with the books myself, mm-hmm. uh, with the Ultimate books, with the uh, Marvel Now books, and I'm I'm kind of enjoying Axis at the moment because the Red Skull has basically got the powers of Charles Xavier and has now turned into Onslaught mm-hmm. because Magneto tried to kill him. Well, yeah. Magneto crushed his head with a rock. Um, and you know, the, the guy's now become this onslaught fucking creature and has basically disintegrated the majority of the Marvel universe. And now the villains have become good and some of the good guys have become bad. So I want to see where this heads and if, if this is going to be a temporary thing or if this is going to be something that happens in, in the long run, you know, um, I was reading the new Thor. I understand what they're doing with it, but I kind of don't at the same time. Um, Spoilers on that one, you know, the new Thor's a woman, um, you know, the, the old Thor basically ended up uh, in a situation where he, because of the events of, um, uh, fear itself, not fear itself, um, the, oh crap, what was the new, the new one that they had with Nick Fury? Um, I'm actually kind of behind on it, the, the current events. Yeah, there's there was another event that they did with with uh, Fury. I think it was Fury. It wasn't Fury itself. It was another one. Um, he basically ended up uh, being something who whispered in his ear that made him unworthy of the hammer. So he can't pick the hammer up. Odin tried picking the hammer up. Everyone tried picking the hammer up. So Thor um, went off to to kind of stop something uh, happening on the earth, and then got his arm severed. So now he's, he's, his right arm is like gone and he's using the blood axe as his weapon of choice. Ah. Um, so there's a lot going on currently. Um, Captain America, Steve Rogers is basically been depowered. So he's an old man now. Mm-hmm. Oof. That's yeah. Rough. <laughs> Falcon is now the new Captain America, which I understand the reason why they did it, but if they were going to go this route, I would rather they'd kept Bucky Barnes as Captain America. Yeah, I, I I understand why they're going the route of Falcon, um, but like you said, Bucky Barnes, it, that's his mantle to carry. Yeah. Uh, even though he's more badass when he's Winter Soldier, but it, it's it's I feel like Bucky's ter- done his time. <laughs> like he needs he deserves to be Captain America after all the crap he's been through. Well, the thing is, he's taken over from Fury now as being one of the um, like the main guardian of the Earth, if that makes sense. Uh, cause Fury used to be the guy that they sent in on special ops missions to kill aliens and blast their heads off. And Bucky's kind of taken that role. Now, Death of Wolverine, I'm not a fan of it. That bad? It's that- bad. He goes on the road of redemption, but it's like, killing off a character that one is probably one of the biggest selling characters in the company. Mm-hmm. Um, which is a ballsy move in itself, and two, has a history, and was just redeeming himself. Yeah, I, I, the cool thing that came out of that Marvel Cup of Joe is they talked a little bit about the death of Wolverine without trying to reveal too much. Yeah. Um, and the the guy who pretty much approves and rejects ideas were there, and it wasn't Casada, it was somebody else, and I forget his name. Um, but they were at a retreat talking about their upcoming line, uh, like characters and what they're going to do with them. And they were doing this this event with Wolverine, and like I said, I haven't read it yet, but it was funny to hear the story where they're they're pitching the ideas to the guy, and he's like, yeah, and then he gets he gets really beat up, and then he recovers. And then like, every idea they would give to him, it's like, ah, and he gets really gets really beat up, and he recovers. And then the guy just kind of goes, you, just, you guys want to kill him, don't you? <laughs> and they're all like, oh, absolutely. And he's like, the, the ideas were coming at him a mile a minute. He's like, all right, kill him. That's fine. <laughs> it's about time. He's the only one who hasn't died yet. Let's do it. Kill him. So, I mean, it sounded interesting. Um, I will probably pick it up, whether it gets shitty reviews, um, glorious reviews. Wolverine's iconic, and it's something that you have to... Yeah, it's, it's it's something that I read because I, I had to read it. Uh, and he's one of my favorite characters in the Marvel um, comics. And uh, him and, and Spider-Man, of course, because like, Peter Parker's just completely and utterly awesome. Mm-hmm. Um and that's another thing. Uh, yeah, have you read uh, the event that's going on the edge of the Spider Verse? Uh, it's definitely intrigued me. I see that like Disney XD is trying to do it with their cartoon as well, like where they're trying to bring in the Web Verse or whatever it is. Yeah, they they uh, they try to rush it with Web Warriors. Mm-hmm. 
And it, it's, it's interesting. I fell out of love with Spider-Man, uh, when they put Doc Ock in his brain. Yeah, they, they kind of got rid of that now, and now it's Peter trying to recover. Um, but not making a, a very, he's making a meal out of it at the moment, uh, because he's trying to be Spider-Man and he wakes up basically like, I own a company. Why do I own a company? What the hell happened? <laughs> <laughs> and he's got, uh, with Ock's, uh, former girlfriend to try and build the company. And he's currently got an issue at the moment where he's found this girl who was supposed to be his replacement. She was like woken up, um, as the replacement Spider-Man. Um, and they've got this mating ritual thing going on. Every time they go near each other, they're literally just like mating. Um, and it, they're watching that happen and the, this like Oct girlfriend like spraying them with water to try and get them off one another. It, it makes me laugh so much. Then you've got all these other characters like you've got 2099, um, who's got Miguel O'Hara who's currently in Spider-Man's universe because he's been trapped there. Mm-hmm. Um, you got Ultimate Spider-Man, who's like Miles Morales is wrapping up the Ultimate Spider-Man books, and that apparently he may be making his way into the normal Marvel universe because the Ultimate Universe he defeated the Green Goblin. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you know I will say it is one of the best books I've seen so far because um, it's you can see the levels that this kid's taken because Peter's back. You know the the original Peter of the Marvel Ultimate Universe. He's back and Norman's back. No one knows mm. how the hell that happened. <laughs> he just wakes up from like being dead to being on the like on a fucking table somewhere in a lab. You know. <laughs> and he's the real guy, the real deal. And um, they dug up his grave and everything and he's he's alive. Uh, and Norman came in, kills J. Jonah Jameson, um, because he wanted Jameson to tell the story and Jameson just shot him in the head. Um and him being the goblin, like, you know, I I yeah, I wanted to you to tell my story. Now you die. And it's watching stuff like that, because you never see Jameson really die in the normal Marvel universe. Mm-hmm. But in, in this universe, he's, he's dead. In the normal universe, he's, he's done for. Um, and watching stuff like that, you're like, wow, you know, why would you go that route? Do you know what I mean? Why would you, why would you even go that route? And watching the way that Miles deals with it and comes into his own, it really works. And in terms of comic books, Marvel are doing some things right, but I feel in terms of a fan, I think they're doing a lot wrong. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, the, like dissembling the, the Fantastic Four, um, the original Sin storyline, that was it. It's called Original Sin, um, which was done so well. They then, you know, because they revealed that Mick Fury is actually like fucking 80. You know, do you know what I mean? And uh, mm-hmm. he's he's kind of, if you want, look at the end of the storyline, spoilers, ladies and gentlemen, he does take <laughs> on the role of the, the Watcher eventually um so you get to see stuff like that and it's 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 intriguing um but in in terms of what's happening at the moment it's like the fantastic four for instance you you look at it and think why would you you know why would you disassemble the fantastic four why would you um end up ending that book and you know i'm I'm currently the one that that is intriguing me is axis but I'm, i'm becoming more of a dc guy because the DC comics for me are becoming more interesting to read. I, I think that they've got an unfair advantage too, because uh, DC Comics has Jeff Johns. Yeah, and he Jeff is... Johns can turn everything to fucking gold. He turned oh. the man badass. He redeemed uh, Green Lantern How... when it came to a world where everybody went, "Huh, Hal, yeah, screw that guy, Hal Jordan. Who cares?" He took him and like phenomenal work writing. Um, and that, and that's the big thing here. It's like, it's one of those things you look at it and think, how the hell, you know, could someone redeem Hal Jordan? Because I remember, um, him being the embodiment of like death himself, um, mm-hmm. eventually. What was the, what was the character's name? Uh, he was a Spectre, right? Spectre, yeah. And, uh, who basically, he would find out, um, who committed wrong in the DC universe and basically kill, he's their version of Ghost Rider. Um, mm-hmm. he would become the Spectre, he merged with the Spectre. Um, and currently they're doing something at the moment called Future's End, where they're destroying the entire New 52 DC universe. Um, but they, they've got so many good books as well. They've got like Green Lantern, they've got the Aven- uh, the, not Avengers, uh, the Justice League, which is very interesting because Lex Luthor has just joined the Justice League. Um, you've got like Red Hood and the Outlaws, you've got, um, you know, Supergirl, Red Lanterns, Green Lanterns. 
Um, and, and everything is interesting because they always manage to tell these stories that work really well. Now, and I will say Green Lantern has kind of been slipping a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of like great books, they still got some amazing books going on. Like I'm, I'm reading Batman and Robin where Bruce is trying to save the life of his son, Damien, who, who's dead, but he's ended up on apocalypse for some reason. Um, they, they've stolen his body. So he's going, gone to apocalypse to kind of, uh, resolve it and, and, you know, save his son. But it's stuff like that, that it's, it's extremely, extremely interesting. Um, because when you look at a character like Darkseed and having someone who's not the most powerful guy in the DC universe going to Apocalypse to get his dead son and dead like ex-girlfriend's body from them is... You, do you know what I mean? It, it's like fucking... He'll kill himself um, by doing it. But he's he's going there and he's standing toe-to-toe. And then you've got like Cyborg and the rest of the Bat family going after him. Um, you know, I, I loved like what was happening with Teen Titans, um, what they were called in that, you know, they've, they've got so many, they've, they've t- retold these old stories, but in new ways. And it's something that you never really would see in the DC universe or the Marvel universe, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so m- moving on from that though, um, Ultimate Alliance, do you think, what do you think the reason is why they haven't brought these games back? I think because they're doing the Marvel Online, um, that's got to take up a lot of resources. It's a shitty carbon copy of it, though. It, it's it, I played it. Uh, I got the to beta test the game, and it's it's extremely shitty. The graphics are bad. The, the sprites don't look right. They look like mannequins, um, and it it just seems like a shittier version of Marvel Ultimate Alliance. I I could. It does seem like they're phoning it home, um, and in an attempt to battle DC Universe online and at the same time to compete with things like Warcraft and things like Diablo and things like that. Um, they probably f- have thrown, which is shocking because it's Disney, but they've probably thrown their entire division into this Marvel Online and that's why I think we're seeing a slowdown in Marvel games. Because uh, we really haven't had a good one since uh, I would say Ultimate Alliance. They've got the Avengers Assemble one on Wii U, which is, it's okay. It's a, kind of like a Mortal Kombat style one with Avengers and Scrolls. Um, and the Deadpool game, but that was a different studio, I believe. But it's, it's just a shame because, uh, they have so much stories to tell and they can do it via game since they can't do it via movie because it's, some of these stories get really outlandish and require characters that they don't have the rights to. And cartoons, it seems like when they start getting their footing with some of these storylines, uh, they cancel the series and then they create a new one that doesn't have a cool theme song. So, um, in terms of the way that they're dealing with things with Fox, you know, like canceling the Fantastic Four, um, killing off Wolverine, totally like dismantling their X-Men teams. Mm-hmm. Do you think that Marvel has a huge issue with the the properties that Fox won't let go of them. I think they have accepted uh, the X Men universe, which is okay. I mean, they got into a little bit of a battle with the Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch, but I think for the most part, Fox is doing them justice. Like, right? Fox does, yeah. Fox does X Men. They're doing them justice. The Fantastic Four, on the other hand, I think that's a big f you to them. I think that's a thing of saying, look. Uh, you're not, you don't know what you're doing with the properties. You're just gonna put out a shitty movie to keep the properties, and you'll never know what to do with the properties. Just give it back. Um, with Spider-Man, it's another scenario where it, it, I know there's been rumors around the internet that he may come back, and it's always, yet yeah, will he, will he, won't, will he, won't he, will Sony invest the time that Marvel and Fox are trying to do with their franchises? But I, I think... Well, they tried, Fox, no, and, and Amazing Spider-Man 2 just was, ugh, it was awful. Yeah. Um, because they didn't focus on one central story. They just tried to tell about 20 stories at once. Yeah, it, it's a shame. And I think if Fox ended up giving X-Men back to the Mar- uh, Marvel Disney World, we wouldn't get uh, many X-Men movies. It would fall into a line where you get an X-Men movie every five years uh, and just an X-Men movie you wouldn't be able to get these side stories with Gambit that we're going to get, or Deadpool that finally got greenlit, or the Uncanny X-Force. I think 
Marvel and Fox has an understanding at that point that, yes, take that entity and run with it. Yet we, it's unfortunate we will never get Wolverine in the Avengers, but Wolverine's in enough to the point where let them build an X-Men universe and we'll build a new universe revolving around the Avengers. And I think we win with those entities being separate. I'd rather have those two separate where they're all trying to pump out six movies at a time than have them combined and only get six movies instead of 12. And just because we want Wolverine and the Avengers. Don't you think they can negotiate something like what Sony apparently is doing with, with Spider-Man? They're negotiating with um, Marvel to allow him to be in the Avengers universe, but they I, do the, the, the Spider-Man movies separate. I think... Um, Sony's only doing that, and th- this is just me being speculative. I probably spelled that word wrong because I'm stupid. Um, it- it's Sony saying, yeah, here's Spider-Man, and we'll take like a hit when it comes to what we would get back in return money-wise, but we will get more money with him appearing in Avengers and maybe Captain America 3 than we would if we keep trying to do solo shit with him. Well, it, it worked um, in a sense like, you see, like Captain America, Iron Man... Um, if you see like these movies that have spawned off from the Avengers movies, all of them have grossed over 700 million. You know, Iron Man 3 grossed over a billion. You know, yeah. uh, Captain America 2 grossed over like 700 million. That was a great movie. I, I think the way that that story was told was amazing. If you haven't seen it, guys, Captain America Winter Soldier, go and watch it. Hell, if you don't know anything about comics, go watch it. It's a great thriller movie. Yeah, it's, it's basically like the Bourne, Captain America in a Bourne movie. And yeah. it's, it, it's so good. Um, and it also ties into Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which is great. Mm-hmm. Then you've got, like, Thor, uh, The Dark the dark World. Again, another great movie. And these movies managed to gross and make a lot of money for each title character because they've spawned off from the Avengers movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and it gives them a chance to gamble on things like Ant-Man and the Guardians of the Galaxy, which Guardians being the most successful one they've had thus far. Yeah, um, because Guardians itself has had, I, I believe it's made... Uh, over 700 million in its own right as well. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you see like with these, the movies themselves, like with the Fox movies, don't you think they would profit a lot more if they allowed Marvel to use the mutant name? Cause they can't even use mutant. They're calling these guys miracles apparently. Uh, I, here's what I think Fox's mentality is. It's yes, we could make more money, but we are making enough without putting as much effort into it as they are. Sony, I feel like, uh, after the disappointment that was Amazing Spider-Man 2, is now grasping at straws and like, all right, all right, all right, do you still have interest in Spider-Man? Maybe we can work out a deal. Whereas Fox saying, eh, we could stand alone. We don't really need your help. Because uh, Days of Future Past was amazing. They, they got the right director, they got someone that cared, and they got a cast that cares. Um, and Apocalypse uh, should be phenomenal. But... Yeah. But they're not going to be using the same cast from the original X-Men movies. They're going to be using the uh, first-class cast, which I think is a good idea because, you know, it allows them to, to keep telling those stories. And apparently they, they will be having Hugh Jackman in that again. Uh, yeah, I think that's one of his uh, last ones, that and the Wolverine 3. Yeah. Um, and then they're going to continue. Um, and apparently Jackman said he will continue on as Wolverine until he gets bored. Um which, uh, and also there's, there's rumors going around that, um, apparently Robert Downey Jr. is rediscussing his contract with Marvel now because of the fact that everything he's done outside of the Iron Man movies hasn't really made an impact as much as his, you know, his, his self-worth isn't as big as it is with Marvel right now. I, I think it's a shame because now he's got the Johnny Depp syndrome. Yeah. Every time I see him in a movie, he's Tony Stark. Whereas every time I see Johnny Depp in a movie, you're just Jack Sparrow. Yeah. They they became that character. Same with uh, Hugh Jackman. Every time you see him, it's like, oh my god, the Wolverine's in Les Mis? I can't believe he's singing. But he's still do, making you know good money in those movies. He, I think he. the difference between them and him is he basically chooses his roles wisely. He mm-hmm. won't do something unless it's something that he knows is a good story. Um, and I think with RDJ, he his star is kind of waning uh, mm-hmm. at the moment because nobody wants to see him in anything but Iron Man. Yeah, it's a shame too because he's on the back half of, uh, like he's hit that hump and he's going. Mm-hmm. Um, 
they, uh, like you said, the judge actually looks interesting, but every promo I've seen from it, he's talking like he's Tony Stark. So I think, like you said, uh, Hugh Jackman picks his role as well, and he can break away from Wolverine because he has a different accent. Yeah. Robbie Downey Jr., he just sounds like Tony Stark in everything he does. When he walks out on stage as Robert Downey Jr., it's like watching Tony Stark. Yeah, and, and the thing is as well, he made Tony Stark his own. He he gave Tony Stark back to the, the guy who was very arrogant and very um, basically, uh, and it, in a sense, he is annoying as well in his own right because he's so intelligent, he knows he's intelligent, and he's like, well, fuck you. You know, I'm, I'm fucking Iron Man, bitch. Mm-hmm. And with the way that he works the character, it allows him to progress in such a way that it builds up Tony Stark's character. And the, the problem now is the way that they've gone about themselves, it made the, um, yeah, it, it, it's basically put him into a corner. Um, but now he's, you know, he's been confirmed for Captain America 3, uh, which I think was a smart move for DC to kind of like move away from that, if that makes sense, to, to kind of say, mm-hmm. we're not going to put Batman versus Superman on this date because Marvel's going to kick our butt. Oh, with the success that Captain America 2 did? Yeah, exactly. and then to add Robert Downey Jr. to it, it's like, <laughs> yeah, you don't stand a chance. Yeah, and... Let, you know, uh, as it, that continues, you, you see the way that they're basically becoming more and more, um, you know, bigger in terms of the, the, in terms of the ways that these movies gross. Now, do you think it's kind of sacrificing the, the games as well? Because they really haven't put out a really good Marvel game for ages since Ultimate Alliance. Mm-hmm. You know, um, what, what would you, if, if you could basically say to Marvel, hey, you know, uh, put out another game, what would you do? I would treat your games like you treat your movies. Get a, get a staff and say, this is where we're starting, this is where we'll end. You should start with something such as, we're gonna start with Secret Wars, or like Secret Invasion. We're gonna go with these, the scrolls and all that. Then we'll progress the game, the second game will be House of M. Yeah. From House of M, We'll move on to, uh, what was it? Civil War? Yeah. And then from there, Avengers vs. X-Men. It, and then y- you can even throw in small sub-stories, too, that, like, you could spin off from the game. I, I-, I think they need to put as much detail and concern into their games as they do their movies and TV, and we would we would all benefit. But I can't argue because their, TVs and their, their TV shows and their movies are so great that... Yeah, I'm I'm losing out on the games, but then I don't want to lose out on mo- uh, movies because you're going to focus there. Yeah, I think it's finding the right game company that can do it justice, that they can allow to work on their own in a sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but going on from that, let's uh, look at another one of the games on your list. We're, we're getting to the, the final furlong, as we will, in terms of the games that you, you picked here. Twisted Metal 2. Ah. What, you know, I know you played this one in your charity event. Um, mm-hmm. The De- 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 Tecla Gaming for a Cause. And it's it kicked big, it off. Yeah, it's a, it a big one for you as well, um, and something that you and Gibby loved playing together. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Why is it a game of choice for you? Uh, the Twisted Metal franchise has always been awesome. Cars destroying other cars, having special powers, uh, being a cop, being a bike, being a freaking tank. It's, it's, it's an awesome smash and bash uh, cohesion of a game. Yeah. Um, and, and Twisted Metal 2 was the specific one because of the stories. Yeah. Each character had a reason that they were entering the tournament, and then the way that their reason was twisted against them by Calypso. Um, they didn't really follow through with that too much in future games. It was more of a, let's just focus on the smash and bash without reason. And I, I really felt like they were going to get back to it in Twisted Metal for the PS3. And they kind of did. But instead of doing like, oh, we've got ten drivers, um, and they all have their own story, it, it got down to we have three drivers with ten vehicles to choose from, and the three drivers have stories. Um, it was still a good game, but Twisted Metal Two, I think, was so much better. Um, so tell us basically a, a lot more, a little bit more about Twisted Metal Two. Why do you um, find the game so intriguing, in a sense? 
it was another one of those where it was one of the, the first things that I owned. Um, Sega was the first system that I had owned. When it came to games that I purchased on my own, it was Twisted Metal 2. Um, it was the first one. It was like, oh, I got it. My friends don't have it. I, I went out of my way, and I took my birthday money, and this is what I put it to. Um, and it, it was a multiplayer game where like friends would come over and say, hey, let's play video games. Let's play Twisted Metal 2. That's what we're going to do. Kind of like with a lot of people saying, let's go play Goldeneye. And that was their go-to thing, and that was their big, that was their memory for 64 and such. Me, it was Twisted Metal 2. Everybody came to my house to play Twisted Metal 2 and to shoot at each other, and the stories were amazing, and it was just great to be a kid back then. <laughs> so um, in terms of games that you like, like that, for instance, what was the, the, the kind of the hook? Was it the, the driving, the blood, the gore um, that, that allured you to the game, or was it the story? Uh, a little mix of both. You, like I said, for most of these games, it's always the story that attracts me to it, unless it's just the nostalgic factor. Um, the stories were cool, but I, I really enjoyed that you get to a level and you're in Paris in one level and you you find that secret where you can blow up the Eiffel Tower and then drive on the rooftops. And just, there was always like nooks and crannies in each level and secrets to get codes and stuff like that. It was just, it was a, it was kind of ahead of its time. Graphics-wise, no. But it was just like, let's put Easter eggs in a game and see if you can find them. And that is kind of what hooked me. Like, okay, did you see that thing in the New York level? If you blew up the billboard, there's a code back there for Dark Side or something, or Minion. And it, it was just very intriguing and a lot of fun to play, and there was a lot of replay value with it. Mm. So um, tell tell me a little bit about um, the characters. Which characters do you prefer to play? I was always Outlaw, and I, I, I even when we moved on to the T, uh, Twisted Metal for PS3, uh, Outlaw, the cop wasn't in it, but uh, the vehicle was, and I always picked Outlaw. The cop car scenario, being a cop in a tournament full of killers, sinners, uh, egotistic maniacs, was always intriguing to me, and it's probably the as much as I keep telling people I'm a jerk and I'm a dick and I, I love to play the bad guy uh, in certain scenarios, I gravitate to the good guy. Infamous, I always played the good storyline first. And to me, the cop was the good guy in it. And that's what the, I would always go with Outlaw. So um, let's, uh, let, let's move on from that game then and, and talk about another PlayStation mainstay. Uh, a game that's going to be basically uh, being multi-platform this time around, of course, with Metal Gear Solid Five. Um, it's all about the Metal Gear Solid series because you you did say it's one of your favorite games. Have you played um, Ground Zeroes? Uh, no, and that's the one that just came out for PS4, right? It, it's the one on PS4, PS3. It's on it's multi-platform. It's basically a demo mm -hmm. um, that they decided to release as a full game. Um, when it originally came out, it was like 40 bucks. I think now you can probably get it for like two bucks. Um, but it, it was kind of a prelude to Metal Gear Solid 5, The Phantom Pain. Uh, yeah, I was going to get it, um, but I, I, had re I thought I had read, and maybe it's just me misunderstanding things, is that it wasn't a full game. Yeah, it, it wasn't. It, it's so basically like one level. Yeah, so it's like I don't want to really put out 50 bucks for one level. Mm. Um, but I, I, I do love the franchise. I started with Metal Gear Solid for PS1, um, then played VR Missions, then went into Sons of Liberty. Didn't play Snake Eater. I have it, but I never got a chance to get around to it. And I bought four, but never, again, never played it. So um, let, let's um, talk about the, the love of that game. You, you were, were you a fan of Metal Gear Solid um, 1? Um, you're talking the PlayStation one where it was two discs, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, I thought it was phenomenal. I, I absolutely loved it. And that was another one where me and Gibby kind of bonded. He owned the game and he'd come over and we'd play it and it was always fun. It, great story. Uh, not that I'd probably understood it very well as a kid. Um, but it, it, it was just very interesting. Uh, and I felt not connected, but I, I definitely felt uh, an attraction to the characters where when you had to make that tough decision of who lived and who died, mm -hmm. it was like, oh, holy shit, this is this is way too heavy for me. Um, and it didn't matter in the end because of the way the series panned out, but 
it, it was definitely the two disc thing was great. It was a long, very long game, and just the style and just little things. We always had a running joke in the house too. Is uh, yeah. there's the one section where he gets in a box and people walk by just like, oh, just a box. Whatever reason that line stuck, and we would just walk through the house up just a box whenever we'd see a box. Yeah. It was hilarious to us, but at the same time, probably really stupid to the outside. So, um, in, in terms of that game, do you think that the story is also what intrigues you? Yeah, for sure. Um, very good storytelling. And like most games, like I've said, is that that's what hooks me. Um, even Sons of Liberty, when they introduced a new person instead of playing a snake, and I can't, Raiden, um, it was a good story, and I loved playing it because of the good story. I don't know why I fell off for Snake Eater. It may have just been I didn't buy it at the time, and then bought it later, and then just never went back to the previous gen system. But it's it, it's a good story. It's it's a lot of the it's kind of it's got the shades of like your Call of Duties and stuff like that, but it's got a story around it that's that's interesting. And would, I honestly would love to see Snake make a big screen appearance at one day. Yeah, because they they did talk about it, and for a lot of people who don't know, the the character Snake was actually based on um, Snake Plissken from Escape in New York. Mm -hmm. And um, in in a sense, uh, there's another game that we can talk about quite quickly that turned into a comic book in its own right, um, which the the comic's doing really well at the moment for DC, and that's uh, Injustice Gods Among Us. Uh, How did you play that game? I did. Uh, That was the holy crap storyline. Um I don't think I've ever... I remember being in the basement playing that. I'm getting away from myself. And there's one spot in it. Um, Dan Ralph was playing with me, and there was someone else in the basement, and I forget who it was, but we're playing the game, and there's the one moment, and spoiler alert, um, Superman kills Shazam. Yeah. And it, for me, it was like, holy shit. Even Dan, uh, someone who's not into comics, knew Shazam was a kid. And Superman just killed him because he made, like, one simple mistake. Where, yeah. like, it wasn't even, like, a, it's not a killing offense. And it was just, we just sat there in silence staring at the game. I haven't had too many games do that to me. Yeah, and it, it, it's one of those as well where you could see how someone could go totally and utterly insane. You know, someone who stood for truth, for justice, basically warp himself and say, well, you know, um, I killed my wife, I killed my child. But it wasn't my fault. Mm-hmm. To, no. to quote Huey Lewis, the power of love. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and it's, and it's mad, isn't it? How someone can just turn from being so, so amazing, so human. We're, we're kind of realizing that Superman is human in the end. Mm-hmm. He's corruptible. He can be corruptible. And then the great thing for those of you who haven't read the comic books, read them now because it's just gone to year three. And it's, oh my god, it, it, Superman's a fucking nutcase. He's now joined the Sinistro Corps. Um, had a bullet, re- a, crypt- a kryptonite bullet removed from him, uh, after he killed Oliver Queen. You know, I, it's, oh, it, it's massive. It, even though it's an Elseworld story, it's intriguing to watch someone who's such a prominent hero go down the fucking shitter. You know, his, his brain just go darker and darker and then him, Starting not to regret, you know, he starts to make threats like "I will kill your wife and children." Mm-hmm. Superman would Superman kill someone's wife and kids, and, and this guy's saying it. You know, it's really weird. Hey, to be honest with you, I, I'm not one who uh, li- Superman to me is one of the most boring comic book characters in, in ever because he, he's a man who fights a rock. Uh, to me, the, the sub characters around him, such as Lex, are much more interesting and the only thing that really carries the series. When he made that turn in Injustice, I was I was invested because not only does he go crazy, he immediately turns on Batman. Yeah, and there there have been several instances uh, in comic lore where you don't fuck with Batman, <laughs> mm-hmm. and he has taken Superman down on numerous occasions in different scenarios, and even one where he was like a sixty year old man, he took down Superman. Yeah, um, but I I really think it opened up a door that made Superman more relatable because it's very hard to connect with a character that is indestructible. No matter what he does, he always bounces back 
And at the same time, it's very hard to relate. When he lost Lois and the child, it was like, I can see why he would turn. Mm. It, it, it just it shows the vulnerability that was never there before. Yeah, and the, the thing as well, like you've got characters in, in the comic book that you wouldn't have heard about in the game, like John Constantine's in it. And it talks about his, the reason why he's going after Superman now. You know, you've got like Batman organizing the troops and trying to, to get everyone together to fight back. Uh, even though there's, you're going against the strongest man in the universe. Um, the one person who could probably fight Dark Side, you know, toe to toe and mm-hmm. fucking kick his ass. Yet he's now in a position where, they tr- they can't do anything to hurt him, but yeah. they're still going to try. Mm-hmm. You know, it's and he's insane. He's literally insane. You know, um, what would you you know what would you do in that situation? Say like Superman's basically trying to to turn into this fuck. It is turned into this complete psychopath. What would you do? He he turns into a dictator. Um, more or less, he he is broken by the events. If I was in his shoes, uh, are we assuming that I have the same powers and such? Yeah, we'll say like you're in the similar position as Batman. Uh, if I was Batman, that's the moment to initiate your plan to take him the hell down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't hesitate. You take him down. He's, he clearly he snapped. He killed the Joker. Um, at that moment, he, here I stand as Batman as a guy that as much shit as the Joker has put me through, I've never killed him. Mm. And another man, Superman, who doesn't kill, just, you know, he crossed that line. And to me, as being Batman, that's the line that as soon as one of us crosses, yeah. you need to be handled. So um, that's that's the thing. And and this is what makes the story so unique is he's crossed that line. And are you interested in the second game that they release eventually? They're, they're releasing else. another one? They should be soon. Uh, NeverRealm Studios have said that they will be doing another Injustice game. I am, I am totally in then. That that first story caught me, and it was it was a great fighting pack. Um, it was it was a good it was a great game overall. Um, and I like Sinestro. Sinestro was in it, so I'm in. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's the one thing as well. They've kind of tried to redeem Sinestro in the DC universe at the moment. Um, he's got his own ongoing series. You know, he's um basically managed to take Parallax and merge with Parallax and control him at the same time. Mm-hmm. You know, um, in, in that sense, he's basically one of those um, characters that you find intriguing because he's flawed in his own mythology. He thinks what he's doing is right. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he's not doing it because he wants to take over the world. He's not doing it because he's evil. He's doing it because he feels that fear is the only way to stop everyone from, you know, being a danger to themselves. Yeah, without a doubt. And it's very, uh, Sinestro has always been an interesting character to me, and he is a perfect polar opposite of Hal Jordan. And that's why I think that series worked so well. Mm. And, you know, in, in terms of, like, the, 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 basically the, the series itself, do you think it will go from strength to strength? Uh, I think so. I, th- I think we can. Um, be interesting to see what they do with it. Mm, I, I agree with you on that one. Um, so uh, on that note, in, in terms of like basically the games that you've played, this has been a uh, Christasis collection of games. So now we go on to the plugs, Mr. Dace. Um, what are you currently doing that you haven't told us about already? Or you can just do a little repeat on what you tell us. So just let the, the audience know. Where they can find you? Uh, you can find me. Uh, the Dace Man Show has a YouTube. There's a lot of new content going up as much as possible. Edited a project right before we jumped on this. Uh, hopefully a new series that will spin off. Keep your eye on Basement Protocol. We will be pushing out content soon. I hope. You stupid actors. Um, and I, I am a contributor to FanboysAnonymous.com. And just check out everything that's going on there as well as the Dave Span Show Wednesday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern, on MegapowersRadio.com. 
So there you go, guys. Uh, make sure you check out Dacel Main. Always, you can find us on uh, Facebook.com forward slash I Got Gameplay. Uh, we're on Block Talk Radio slash uh, RU hyphen network. Um, and we're also on Twitter as well. You can find us at Unlim Radio. Um, Facebook, uh, Facebook.com forward slash Unlim Radio as well. Uh, where you can get updates on us and also retroalum.com. Uh, you can find me, facebook.com, Michael Burhan, and uh, I will keep you guys up to date with the projects that we're going on at the moment. Uh, the Silent Hill Kickstarter is going to be starting up uh, by the end of this week. I've just got to make sure that I get everything out there to everybody. Uh, we've got a video coming up for my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash The Nerd Genius, uh, which is over 52,000 views at the moment, guys. And thank you for everyone that's been watching my videos. Uh, more stuff from the, the MCM Comic Con coming up. Uh, Play Expo. Uh, the interviews will be coming up as well. They'll debut the first interview with myself and Chris Barry, uh, Rumor from Red Dwarf. That will be debuting on the Retro Unlim channel, and then the rest of the interviews will be on my channel. Um, and just a whole load more of content coming, more reviews, more film reviews. Um, and hopefully we're going to be seeing episode three of this show for hire coming as well, uh, as I've nearly finished on the edits on that as well. Uh, so guys, check that out. Um, from one of the hardest working men on the internet to another one of our hardest men, working men on the internet as well. Just remember, this is Michael Burhan, and this is Chris Day saying that we've got gameplay. Have you? Mm-hmm.